Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I'm an engineer and my passion is design, development and prototype production of all sorts of engineering solutions. In this episode I would like to share some thoughts on and practices with adjusted bearing arrangements. This is because I just finished designing and building this welding positioner here which uses an adjusted bearing spindle. So this was some good opportunity for some video footage. Now we find adjusted bearing arrangements in all sorts of machine tools like milling machine spindles, lathe head stocks, some grinder spindles, what have you. And you may say it's complete overkill to use an adjusted bearing arrangement on a welding positioner <laughs> and be that as it may. However, I wanted to achieve really long service life and really high robustness with this compact design and compact it is for the load it can take. So let's take a look. In an adjusted bearing arrangement, two bearings are axially preloaded in some kind of way before the spindle enters service life. Now this is done in order to give the spindle a higher rigidity, longer bearing life, in some cases tolerance against thermal relaxation and in general it gives the spindle greater robustness if everything is done right. The preload can for example be achieved by fixing the inner rings and pushing together of the outer rings. Or it can be achieved vice versa by fixing the outer rings in the housing and pushing together of the inner rings. Or by some other way as well, whatever works for the design at hand. With an adjusted arrangement we typically find shoulder ball bearings, tapered roller bearings or we may even find plain radial ball bearings, such as these two crappy ones here. As a heads up though, the adjusted bearing arrangement is one of three typical bearing arrangements. The other two are locating and non-locating and semi-locating arrangements. This one is sometimes used in machine tool spindles, but the last one is a quite rare occurrence in our tool rooms. Nevertheless, this episode is just about the adjusted arrangement. The two essential questions about the adjusted bearing arrangement now are How high a preload should I use and how should I set this particular preload? Let's take a look. Before we address these two questions though, let's take a look at the involved working principle. This simple experiment that I've prepared here should mechanically represent a spindle bearing arrangement. The threaded rod here represents the rotating part of the spindle. Then this drilled plate here represents the spindle housing and the two springs, they represent our two bearings or more explicitly the springs model the bearings axial elastic behavior but don't get confused by these expressions. The spacer up here or I should hold it this way the spacer up here is just to get a better view of the ruler this one when I put the load on the spindle. You can think of the spacer as the chuck of your spindle So, first setup. We have a spindle with no preload. You can see this because the lower spring is completely free and has no preload. So this is similar to a locating non-locating bearing arrangement with the upper spring or the upper bearing as the locating one. Now let's keep in mind the initial chuck position which is at roughly 48 millimeters I'd say. Now let's assume we put some axial load on the spindle for example by drilling into a workpiece and let the load be the weight of these masses here okay of course the upper bearing now uh, elastically deflects a bit due to the load. Now we are at I would say 22 millimeters 
So the difference to our initial reading of 48 millimeters gives a deflection of 26 millimeters. Let's keep this number in mind. Okay, so far for the non-preloaded bearing arrangement. Now, second setup. Let's put some preload on our bearing arrangement. A bit less, so the numbers are straight. Yeah, that's good. So, our initial or unloaded chuck position is at, I would say, 32 millimeters. Now let's load the spindle just like before. With these two weights. And our new position, or our deflected chuck position, is at roughly, well, I would say 19 millimeters. Yeah, this is a very precise uh, experiment. So with preload, the deflection is from 32 to 19 millimeters, which equals roughly 13 millimeters spindle deflection. Hmm. You surely noted that this is only half of what we had in the unpreloaded case before. To my younger self, back in the day this was very unintuitive, since the bearing stiffnesses, these two, they are still the same. So how can it be that the system becomes more rigid by preloading it? Frankly, the principle is the same as when you tune your guitar. As you tighten the string, that is, you increase the preload, the vibrational frequency gets higher. This is because the rigidity increased. Just like here. But back to our case at hand. What happens here? And for this, keep an eye on the lower spring here. Or the lower bearing. As I increase the load on the spindle, you see that it relaxes away from its preload state. So you could say, as we load the spindle, the preload relaxes. This way the spindle deflection is notably smaller, since with increasing the external load, the internal load decreases. And this causes higher spindle rigidity with bearing preload. Simple as that. And higher spindle rigidity is good. Infinite rigidity would be even better. <laughs> but life is no wishing well, is it? Now, consider this extreme case here. The spindle load is so high that the preload almost vanishes. This is roughly here. This constitutes the design case according to which we set the preload. In other words, we determine the spindle's preload from this here, maximum external load. This is done because the designer wants to keep the bearing rollers or balls in permanent contact with the track. Not only gives this high rigidity and robustness for the spindle, because all rollers are in contact regardless of their tolerances. This can also increase bearing life because abrasive sliding of the rollers on the tracks as they start contact again is prevented. What's interesting about this case is that with maximum spindle load, which is roughly here, we have no additional internal load, the preload vanishes. And this is also true with the external load in the other direction. So this is a really smart detail about the adjusted bearing arrangement. What I also want you to note is that our chuck deflection in the design case with maximum external load is a roughly I would say 16 millimeters and this is this is 16 millimeters away from the preload position and this preload position 32 millimeters is 
also 16 millimeters away from the unpreloaded position. So we have pretty much equal distances. Unpreloaded case to the preloaded case and then to the case of maximum external load. So if we see it in terms of compression length of the upper spring or the upper bearing, we see that the maximum external axial spindle load is roughly twice the preload. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a very good rule of thumb for determining the necessary bearing preload. But before we proceed to the practical part, a word of caution here. We just considered axial forces so far. Machine tool spindles must deal with all sorts of axial and radial loads and combinations of them. This complicates the preload determination a bit. Also, in our model case here, we have two identical springs or two identical bearings. Your spindle may have such an arrangement, but spindle bearings are not necessarily of equal size. Also, we almost completely neglected spindle and housing deformation here, because our model springs are so much more flexible than the threaded rod and the plate. In reality, this may not be the case, particularly with very rigid roller bearings. Just as a quick note here to give you an idea of how good or how bad our rule of thumb from before is. This is an older calculation of mine in which I determined the preload on a spindle by means of calculation. This is not the welding positioner spindle though, this is something I did a few years ago. In this sample we have combined external loadings, we have bearings of different sizes, we have spindle and housing flex also considered in this computation. And to give you an idea of what's going on here we have a maximum axial spindle load of 9980 newtons and the preload to be used with the spindle is 4400 newtons. So you see our rule of thumb really applies here quite well even though all the details which we neglected before were considered in this computation here. So enough theory and back to our practical example at hand. I want this welding positioner spindle to be able to deal with loads of up to 100 kg or roughly 220 pounds with the spindle in vertical orientation. So this means maximum axial spindle load uh, roughly 100 kg and according to our rule of thumb from before we must set the spindle bearings to a preload of roughly 50 kg if we want the bearing rollers to be in permanent contact with the tracks. Yeah, but how do we set that? This spindle design is very simple. What we have here are two bearings of equal size sitting on this one diameter of the spindle. The right one here leaning against this spindle shoulder and this housing shoulder and the left one leaning against this housing shoulder and this uh, face of this castellated nut in the back here, which is used to adjust the preload. So far so good. But again, how do we set 50 kilograms preload with this? The preload flow of forces are from the face of this nut here, through the bearing, through this housing, this other bearing, the spindle, the threads and the nut back to this face here. So if you said Let's measure the preload immediately with some kind of device or sensor. We would have to install it within this yellow path here. <laughs> with my limited equipment, this is infeasible. No can do. <laughs> but you could say then, why not get the spindle in the vertical position, put 100 kilograms of load on it, Snuck, snuck the nut in the back here gently so the arrangement is free of play and then remove the 100 kilograms. This constitutes our design case, doesn't it? Right, it does. And this is the perfect solution in theory. However, in practice, friction forces at these diameters here, possible press fits here at the outer rings or at the inner rings, uh, run out arrows at these faces here. 
or run out arrows of the bearings themselves make this a difficult and probably inconsistent approach. So what's typically done instead is to tighten this nut in the back here a certain distance from the free of play configuration. This exploits the fact that the bearings behave like the springs in our model. But still, which distance should we use here to preload to 50 kilograms? Well, we can determine this by measuring the axial rigidity of the bearings alone. We could do this on a tensile testing machine such as this fine instrument tester here. But here comes the catch. This machine does not belong to me and also elastic measurements are not straightforward on this kind of gear. And most importantly, who of you has access to a tensile tester? So, I'm pretty sure there's another way to do this. So what I do to keep things simple and reliable is to test this with weights and a test indicator. Okay guys, in this measurement we have to go backwards because it's easier for filming and gives less trouble for me. Uh, you're looking down at the load platform here, which sits on the inner bearing ring and the outer bearing ring sits on this lower ring here and this is on my surface plate. We are measuring with, a, with this 2 micron per division indicator on the lower face of the load platform here to measure how much this deflects axially depending on the load. This here is just a can of paint as a spacer so that we can easily see what's going on on the indicator. And at the moment this arrangement is loaded with 56 kilograms. Sorry about this odd number, but when I borrowed these weights from work, laziness had the upper hand and I took too few of them. And I've set up the indicator so that we are now at roughly 400 microns. And you see the inner bearing ring has a runout of about 10 microns, which should be fine. And now I'm going to take off the first 10 kilogram weight. And let's see where we are now. So this gives us minus 5 microns. So taking off the next 10 kilograms. So I would say we're at minus 7, minus 11 microns, so this gives minus 18, and this leaves us with roughly 6 kilograms on our bearing, and I am sure you will notice that our runout has increased significantly, which is an indicator that we don't have full contact established inside of the bearing. But still we will note the value, or the mean reading, which is minus 29 microns. So I plotted our readings in this diagram here. Don't worry about the absolute number of the indicator readings here. This is just our initial set point of the indicator. And what counts for us are only the differences here. So don't get confused by this. This point here is where we started at, with 56 kilograms of load on the bearing. Then we successively took off 10 kilogram weights each. And this point here is our last reading, with roughly 6 kilograms of load on the bearing and with the bad runout. Consequently, this kink here in the curve marks roughly the load at which our bearing contact tolerances flexed away. And this almost straight line here, this one, represents the bearing's elastic behavior with well-established contacts. Still, what counts is this distance here, from here to there. You see, according to this graph, for the bearing type at hand, with a fixed outer ring, like here, 
we must displace the inner ring axially roughly 36 microns and then our preload is roughly 50 kilograms. But since in our assembly we have two bearings, we must displace the nut in the back here for twice the distance. So that's 36 microns times 2 equals 72 microns. And the most consistent way to do this is to insert a spacer bushing into here, which is the 72 microns shorter than the free of play configuration. Let's do it! So, what's done first is a pre-assembly to take account of all tolerances. Inserting the lower bearing into the housing making sure the upper bearing sits correctly at the spindle shoulder cleaning all surfaces from grit and dirt so our measurement will be reliable this is the spacer bushing but it is intentionally made longer for this pre-assembly and the castellated nut snugging it so we hit the spacer bushing the snugging feels very nice and very quick a gradual snugging would be a problem because this would suggest a runout problem here at the shoulder or at the spacer bushing or at the nut in the back here but no indications of this whatsoever and next we can measure our play what I mean is we directly measure how much the spacer bushing is too long and this includes the assembly's tolerances here. So that's 770 microns play so the spacer bushing is 770 microns longer as it must be for the free of play configuration. Off to the lathe. Before we take off the material from the, uh, the spacer bushing though, I want to make sure that the axial runout of this bushing in this mediocre clamping setup here is good so that I do not compromise our measurement from before. So let's see. So that's a few microns, but I can live with that. Should be fine. Okay, good to go. Surface grinding the bushing would be more elegant, but the 770 microns are a lot to grind away. So the lathe it is. Touching off very carefully. Setting the DRO to Z plus 770 microns. And I'm taking very shallow depth of cuts 
so as not to risk the bushing moving on me in the chuck, which would mess up all our preparations and measuring. So now we are at the play-free length, and this is taking off our remaining 72 microns preload distance. and chamfering the interrupted cut you hear here is because of the overlicing of the thin walled bushing in the chuck okay and now for the final assembly of our Spindle with the hopefully uh, roughly 50 kilograms of preload allowing for roughly a hundred kilograms of axial load on this on this unit The grease I use here is Liebherr special compound ZTK That's really top-notch assembly grease For torquing I have to put on the chuck And that's it. Smooth as licore de murta. Sorry guys about this hideous image here, but it's the video's end. And I think the guy from the YouTube channel Made in Poland established the fact that the welding positioner must at least be able to take the welder's weight. So far for the 100 kilograms, almost, yeah, three quarters of that. Well guys, as always, thank you very much for your interest in this video. I appreciate your time. All the best and thank you.